So hi everyone and welcome. Uh, my name is Katie Fole. I am the curator of modern and contemporary art at the New Orleans Museum of Art and I'm so happy to be here today with my amazing friend and artist Wafa Bilal who was part of a project that we did at NOMA last summer called Bodies of Knowledge for which he presented his installation 16801. Hi Wafa. Hey Katie, how are you? And thank you so much for having me. It's great to chat with you about uh, the project, about our present moment. I'm so happy to to be here with you today. It's like one of the one of one of the windfalls of this crazy moment, right? Is to connect with people like this. So thank you. Oh, absolutely. It's a great way to really leave our confinement and exist in, digitally and connect with each other. For sure. Well, I wanted to start just by asking you if you wouldn't mind to talk a little bit about 16801 um, as a project, how it came to you as an idea and the various ways that it's manifested itself. Yeah, thank you so much. So um, I think uh, we have to go back to 2010 when I got an invitation by Shermoin Mutra at uh, AGW to do a project about um, uh, the lost culture of Iraq, specifically libraries, and I, I, I start immediately thinking about the library that being destroyed uh, during the 2003. And it, during my research, I come across to uh, my one of my beloved libraries. It's uh, the library of the College of Fine Art in Baghdad, which was destroyed uh, in 2003 because of looting and the invasion and they lost 70,000 books and since then they never recover from that loss. And at the beginning of the project, I was thinking about uh, a project that is an installation to inform people uh, of, of, of the loss. But then in the last minute and six years later, um, uh, uh, and that was one month before the opening of the show, I called Shermoy and said, hey, I think I'm changing my mind. I'm not going to do an installation to inform, but rather an installation to, for participation and addressing the key issue here, which is a post-conflict. I think our separation, we always try to, uh, we, we exist in these two zones, the comfort and the conflict zone. We try to inform people of what is happening in, in the in the conflict zone but i wanted this project to move forward to usher a new era of of iraq uh in into the future and uh my hope is uh, and uh, still to uh uh give uh an aid a hand or 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 uh allow people to um to imagine their future and they are not left behind after the dust of war settle. So I told Shermoy, I'm gonna tell you the project and if you don't agree with it, I will just abandon the new idea and go back. And I said, let me tell you first uh, the title. The title is 168 hours and one minute. And the title comes from an anecdote uh, from Iraq history. In the 13th century, at the highest of the golden age of Islam, the Mongolian invaded uh, Baghdad and destroyed all the library, including the library, the House of Wisdom, Beit al-Hikmah. And for them to cross the Tigris River, they gather all the belonging of the libraries in Baghdad, dump them in the river to create a bridge to go to the other side. And the story we were told, the Tigris River ran a blue for seven days, and that is where the title come. The uh, seven days equal 168 hours, and I added one minute looking into the future. So I imagine after seven days, all the knowledge um, washed out of the books. I wanted to pick up these books from the river, put them on the shelf, and give them um, as a reminder of people who participate in, in the rebuilding of the College of Fine Art in Baghdad. And luckily, uh, people uh, worldwide have uh, uh, participated uh, in, 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 in this project. 
project have certain books and many of them are uh, continue to, uh, to, to go to Iraq. Um, in addition to that, uh, I'm happy to say uh, we, I did uh, a second Kickstarter campaign to raise funds to give to the student and faculty at the College of Fine Art to build uh, the reading uh, room. And that was a great um, step too. Uh, either either um, uh, direction I, I, uh, or, or um, collaboration, I collaborated with the veterans uh, in, in the uh, Veteran Biennial in Chicago, where um, I work with the veterans who turn their uh, uniforms into uh, papers, artist paper, and these the artist paper we offer them as a gift instead of the um, uh, uh, white books. And some of these papers made up uniform going to go to Baghdad to the printmaking department for the student to create artwork and send it back to to the state. Wow. It's it was amazing thing to be to be part of this project in New Orleans and. Um, the image that I'm, we're looking at right now is an image of NOMA's galleries with NOMA visitors interacting with the library. And as a result of the project in New Orleans, over 500 books were donated by people that visited the museum to, um, to help restock this library. And, you know, something that really drew me to presenting this project in New Orleans was a lot of the ways that you're thinking about the fragility of knowledge and you know even this legend that you're talking about right this idea of um of knowledge being lost as a result of water mm -hmm. it resonates i think in so in such powerful ways in new orleans even though that feels so far afield from iraq in certain respects and i wondered if you could tell me a little bit about what it meant to you to present this project in new orleans and you know, how it felt having it here and being here and coming to visit the city during the installation. Yeah, well, first I wanted to really thank you for making that happen. And uh, I felt right at home and it was remarkable what you uh, really did there. Uh, beside the 500 book we collected, I collected so many connections and a story from, um, stories from the local, from the musicians, to the veteran who come, to the art goers, to the student. So that was part of it. But I, I, I think what really, why resonate, this project resonate uh, in New Orleans uh, a lot, because both of these places um, suffer from man-made disaster. And both of these places being left um, uh, with no hope after the dust uh, settles, after the water recedes, right? And you could see um, this project premise is not a, a government or um, an organization with a lot of money. It was one person to one person. It was rewarding um, the person who is receiving the book and the person who is given uh, the book. And you could see, I think, there is uh, a mental connection, but also there is a spiritual one into, um, uh, 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 into this project. And I think that comes from witnessing losses and the idea of empathy, that, that the project, and I think a part of art and part of what we do, we raise questions, but also can we um, uh, trigger people participating through that? simple mechanism of empathy, especially for the people who are witness that. And I think when we come together, we are able to build these destroyed places by uh, the man-made disasters. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's through projects like yours, right, that encourage that kind of direct feeling of connection to things that could feel very far away sometimes that I think can really help with yeah. that conversation. I mean, I think, you know, the thing that I found the most powerful about being part of that project in New Orleans is that question that the title poses that you just spoke about, right? Like, what do you do in that moment after loss? Yeah. How do you shift from loss and disaster to recovery? And what does it mean? And I think, you know, so much of your work has been about that, right? How do we go from this place of violence and loss to a place of hope and recovery? And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you feel like this project has helped you think about the moment that we're now facing, where of course yeah. 
you know, yeah. the questions that you're asking in this project, I think resonate so powerfully with what we're all going through and the moment that we're kind of facing right now. No, it's a great question. It really um, uh, put that project and put life experience in the context of what we witness, what I witness. So um, uh, part, part of, I think, what, what keep us moving forward is to imagine the future. But the other part is to uh, dive into our past experiences. I remember what got me out of the war zone, a refugee camp. I remember living in, under the bombing for 45 days in 1991 in my hometown of Kufa after escaping Baghdad. Uh, immediately from the first bomb and how we had to cope and to adjust what we had at the moment and and I think human human uh, are resilient they're adaptable and I think we're gonna go through this moment the other experience I draw from my own life and reflect on this is um, after um, uh, after the war ended in 1991, I had to escape Iraq and I ended up in a refugee camp uh, for two years. When I arrived to the refugee camp, there was absolutely nothing. Uh, as if that moment is recreated now. Now, I think we, uh, sadly, I would say we live in a better moment, even though we all under a threat. But I remember what got me through that is it's the human connection we have, and it is the time, um, it's the thing we occupy our time with. And I, I, I remember one thing, it was um, when life gets tough, we need to escape it. And one thing we use as a mechanism, thousands of us arrived to the camp, and thousands of us had a book they run with. And we established um, a book club in, in, in the refugee camp. And we start giving these books, rotating them, and then we'll come together to do a book reading and contemplate on, on that literature. And I think that these are the moments really going to get us uh, through, through this. And looking forward is going to be the most important thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm finding myself these days when somebody uh, 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 call me or text me, I find myself so generous in returning that because I feel it's not just um, returning of a phone call and application. I feel it's a moment when we all have to be together in it, giving hands to each other in order to get out of it. I know we are not going to get out of this uh, uh, intact and I know we have to reflect on what we lost but also we have to reflect on the present moment to see who is yeah I mean I think you know I think all of us right are in this moment where a lot of what we're thinking about is how do we connect? How do we come together? And you know, how do we take this as a time to see the ways that we are connected? I mean, I know that you know, so much of your past work, especially thinking about your experience in Iraq and then coming to the US has been about that dissonance, right? Like you say, like you just said, the comfort zone and the conflict zone, feeling in some ways like there's a space where a lot of the population feels very far away and others are confronting things immediately. And you know, I know in past conversations about what's happening right now, you've talked about this a lot, right? Saying basically that there is a certain kind of, I mean, opportunity here in that it's one yeah. of the first things we've experienced in our lifetime where the whole world is experiencing something simultaneously. Yeah, um, yeah. I wonder you know, how you see that impacting your future work or your thinking about future conflicts, if you think this can change in some ways, like the dynamics of the Iraq war that you explore, have explored so much in your work, that people can't feel distant from this thing that's facing us all to a certain extent. Yeah. 
Yeah, so Katie, I think we, 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 we have to acknowledge this is universal in terms of entire our planet experience it. It's, it's an equalizer, not in a sense that is everybody is have the same access to the resources, the same access to, to medical care and so on, but it's an equalizer of the same threat is facing every one of us. And I, I believe and I hope when we get out of this, we have to look at one uh, thing, how ephemeral our time is on the planet. We have to reach to our humanity because that's the moment. We are in the moment that is that humanity is, instead of us, is going to save us. But make no doubt about it, uh, we have to examine the inequality in, in, in these societies, in our societies. And um, we see the disparity between the rich and the poor and who get affected the most. I, I, I think we can't say this is just only the government uh, job. It is the government job to bring equality to everybody. But I think it is also our job individually, no matter who we are, to address these issues. And the most important thing is how can we leave the planet for next generation a better place than we exist in it. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's so powerful to hear that kind of future thinking at this moment where it feels like so many of us are just focused on what's immediately before us, but I think you're right. Like we can't lose sight of this, this sense of kind of like future thinking into what the world will become. And we can't lose sight of all of the other struggles that we working we're working through before this and that we continue to face after this and kind of like have to have to think about the ways in which we can even though we're facing yeah. this look into and imagine a better future right that there has to be if there's one point to this it's that we have to come through with something that we've learned something that we can take from this something we can carry forward in a certain way yeah yeah. yeah, I think I think even the work we produce is gonna work. Uh, is gonna change dramatically. Yeah. yeah. So, can you um, can you tell us a little bit about some of what you had been working on right as this was happening, and kind of how you see what you're doing now evolving? Yeah, it is. Um, sometimes things we plan um, it really in in in, in yeah, they. Um, they echo the moment we are in in a very profound ways. I, I, I was, I've been working with a project called In the Grain of Wheat, which is after um, uh, ISIS destroy uh, 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 iconic uh, sculpture in, in, in Mosul in Iraq. There are the wing line, and the wing ball from the Assyrian era. Uh, era. I thought about a way to preserve um, the, them forever and not in a physical way. I thought if things don't exist, nobody could destroy them, right? So I, in collaboration with the Met, I scan what the two uh, 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 replica they have uh, or the wing lion and the wing ball. And then I turned that um, uh, 3D digital scan into binary code. The next step is to attach that binary code into the wheat and insert it in a wheat plant. So attach to the protein, insert into the wheat plant, and then, and then plant it and harvest it this way. Any time, any generation gonna come after us will be able to reverse the technology or scan the plan to recover the the uh, the sculpture and uh, the the uh, the uh, the cultural artifact. Because when a force come in, what do they want it to do in order to destroy the culture? You destroy the art uh, work and their artifact. What if the 
doesn't exist. What if, if it's all ephemeral and it could pack or pack it and even you cannot see it. it that, while I was doing this, we all ran away if from the threat. And what did we do? We isolated ourselves and we become invisible to the threat in order to save ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's how things and projects get connected in a very profound way. I never thought about them. So my hope is um, that we reflect on the moment and we um, cherish our production in terms of, of time using this profound moment to prevail over all the issues we are facing in our own life. It's gonna go, I mean, we are gonna come out of this. Again, not intact, but it's going to be a moment of reflection. It is going to be a sobering moment and it's gonna be a quiet and a profound one. Yeah, I think, you know, thinking about the moment that we're in right now, the thing that I'm really connecting with about, about that piece is that is kind of the idea of like the macro and the micro, this idea that, you know, that these ancient sculptures could be in some way equalized with a grain of wheat, right? That all of these things are, can be carriers of culture and memory and that you can think about them, not, you know, with the icons of civilization on the one hand at the Met and the grain of wheat being harvested by farmers, but that we have to kind of come to an understanding that, every tiny aspect of our lives, the decisions we make, the food we eat, spirals out into all of these bigger cultural questions. And that, you know, I mean, in certain respects, right, the small, tiny actions we're taking today about how yeah. we move and if we move and what we eat and where we get it and how we're interacting with others right now, right, are part of something much bigger. Yeah, and, 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 and also is how nature and technology come on together to, to preserve a human, uh, a human artifact, to preserve culture. And think about this moment we are in compared to 1918. We are doing much better than that time. And it has a lot to do. We study we, um, our past and we apply that knowledge to the present day. So my hope is we take uh, that experience and how we were I didn't take the studies and apply it to the, the social disparities between the classes we have. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, all of us have, have a lot to learn from, you know, the example that you have presented and the way that you have dealt with this, both in your artwork and and as a person. Um, so thank you so much for- Well, Katie, thank you so much for, today and for For coming to New Orleans over the summer and talking to me now. And we hope to have you back in the city before too long. Um, and thank you so much. It, it's a great pleasure. And thank you so much for you providing me the physical uh, platform at the museum and now the virtual platform to reflect on that experience and our present experience. Thank you. I'm grateful. Thank, Thank you. you.